Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Peter Cole, Chief of the Pediatric Program here at the Cancer Institute. More importantly, our host for today. Uh, welcome to everybody who's here and those who those of you who have connected online. Uh, this is our second annual uh, seminar honoring, honoring the legacy of Joe Bertino. Uh, Joe Bertino, as, as we all know, is a, a luminary in the field of uh, cancer research uh, and a, an outstanding clinician and role model. He was a mentor to uh, many of us who are in this room or have worked in this building in the past. Um, and a colleague to uh, many of us here at the Cancer Institute, and we're delighted to be able to honor his legacy with this lecture series. Um, so I want to keep the introduction short and keep things moving so we have time for our speaker and to introduce our keynote speaker for today. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Wenwei Wu uh, from the Department of Radiation. Uh, Hello, everyone. It's my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Arnold Levin, who is really someone who doesn't need an introduction. Uh, so I will try. He received his bachelor in biology from SUNY. PhD from here and then a postdoctorate in Caltech, and then started his career in Princeton University and quickly became the full professor there. And he is really well known for many of us as a discoverer of P53, and it's really due to his work and the discovery uh, helped us to understand the cancer cancer, uh, cancer biology and beyond. And due to his accomplishment and contribution, he received the numerous uh, honors and awards. There's no way to list and tell you all here today. Um, so can just list a couple. Um, he is elected to National Academy of Science as a member and to medicine. Also received the first Albany Medical Center Prize in Medicine and a biomedical researcher. Um, so well, many of these um, huge honors and awards, but more than his own research accomplishment, he also accomplished more as really a builder, uh, not only clinically responding, build up buildings, but also build up community, society, mentoring next generation of the researchers, postdoc students. He built up the Peter History Society chair for the Department of Microbiology in um, Sony Stony Brook, the Department of Molecular Biology. Um, in Princeton University, so the president of the Rockefeller University, and then moved to IAS to establish the Simon Center for System Biology at IAS, and really to uh, concentrate in the interface of molecular biology and uh, physics science. So he's really a great mentor, great vision, and also a great speaker. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's great credit to have him here to share with um, today's talk. <laughs> oh yeah, share. Share. My name's Jeff, so share first. It's a problem. If I want to say a few words about Joe, I, I don't need the slides right now. So we can we can just leave it or we can blank it. Just take us away from talking about Joe. Okay, I appreciate it. And such so, first of all, it's wonderful to be back, actually. It's been really terrific years here with some absolutely spectacular postdocs, some of whom are on the faculty. Uh yeah. Um, I, I had such a good time this afternoon. I'm a little hoarse, so if you don't hear me, raise your hand and uh, I'll try to speak up. Um, but uh, one of the other reasons why, uh, in fact, one of the reasons I said immediately yes to this lecture 
um, is a chance to uh, say a few words about Joe, Joe Patino. Um, it got me thinking about Joe to be able to give a talk um, in his honor. Um, and, and the word that I kept coming back to in my mind was an anchor. Joe, Joe is an anchor. Anchors, of course, keep the ship steady. They don't let it drift. They, they, they advise, they, they help, and they're often hard to lift up, right? <laughs> and all of those things to describe Joe. I knew him, of course, at Memorial first, at Memorial Sloan Canary, and then here, and, and I've heard that he was also an anchor at Yale, for, for example. Um, and anchors actually are people who you go to, anchors in cancer centers, or people who you go to for advice, right? Or you go to to ask questions about the history of the science that you haven't yet lived through and, and things. And, and, and that was really Joe. Uh, I think we all have had the experience of going into his office and getting a lesson. It was actually often hard to shut me up in an office, but I think in Joe's, Joe's case, I just listened. It was, really, it was really a treasure. So let me just go over some things you know. Uh, um, Joe's education actually at advanced education starts at Cornell. But but um, undergraduate. Uh, but what he's noted for actually is that he was the six foot two inch center of their basketball team. Right now, that you can measure time in many ways, right? But I it hit me that you could measure time in a time where the center was six foot two, and the first draft choice for the NBA this year was a seven foot four center, right? <laughs> So it's one foot and two inches in time <laughs> from the time Joe was sent there to the time that the NBA passed over Joe <laughs> with, the, with, with the center. He then uh, got his MBA at Brown State, uh, and he, uh, after being at Washington University, he went to Yale. And, and he was really introduced to the earliest uh, part of chemotherapy and especially single carbon chemotherapy. And uh, that's the first connection I always felt with Joe, uh, because the molecule I'm gonna talk about, which is P53, right, is really dependent for all its different kinds of functions on epigenetic changes of modifications of proteins. It's one carbon chemistry, methylation, acetylation, one carbon chemistry. So Joe pioneers the area of metabolism of one carbon chemistry, and, it, and he pioneers that because of the drug methotrexate, which is a, quite an amazing drug. The drug to last as long as methotrexate has lasted, to be used in the places it's used, is, is a, a testament to his continually updating the, the field, the understanding, the quality of what, you, what you can do. And he really plays a, a, an important role. I think Joe's probably best known for two observations that then happen. Um, the, the first one happens at Yale, and the second one happens on a sabbatical in, in Stanford. Uh, uh, when you put methotrexate into a cell, uh, the enzyme activity, dihyd he was working on one carbon metabolism, dihydrofolic reductase goes up in concentration. Right? The activity of the enzyme goes up. And everybody says, it's an unusual thing to happen when you put in an inhibitor, but the activity of the protein goes up. And, and people were stunned by that. and Joe and everybody else was sort of perplexed by it. And a few years go by, and Joe is on sabbatical at Stanford and should be now. And they find out that dihydrofolate reductase is amplified. Now, that's a cornerstone of cancer, gene amplification. Right? I just wrote down, I, I just chatted, as soon as I thought about that, I just chatted down, right? Uh, dihydrofolate reductase, five million years ago, EGFR, net, now RAS. RAS, the resistance to RAS is to impart amplification, the RAS, the latest RAS drugs, right? And the concept that gene amplification happens in cancer, right, is quintessentially the signature of P53 mutations, right? So uh, Joe and I have a, an intellectual interaction, right? And, and, and we just saw that and talked about it, right? 
And, and of course, it reinforced for me the history of this field. The other thing is how early on methotrexate played a role, right? Treat, treatment of childhood ALLs, right? Amazing. I mean, that was the beginning. It really was the beginning of all. All the things that we do now was, Joe was involved in the beginning. And actually, a single agent methotrexate cured, uh, uh, the, cured uh, um, a, what is it? It's called, <laughs> now I wrote it down, it's such a way I can't even read it now. Uh, but it, it cured another kind of, of leukemia, right? So uh, Joe, Joe's history in science, his sense of history of the field, his ease in which you go and see this anchor and get you're reinforced and you go back out and you do more, right? Is is so much Joe Bertino and, and, and his, uh, the final thing is, Every great person, if they are really good, leaves a legacy. And the history of all the students and all the people that work with Joe and their contributions to science are amazing. I would be remiss, he isn't here, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention Bill Hyde, right? Who's both the founder of this institute, right? Well, I came here as a single individual to start a cancer center. That's what it's about to begin with, right? <laughs> but he, I think, from the day one, had in his mind, I got to get Joe to come down here. And he did. And of course, he built the camp, they built the cancer center in a really extraordinary way. And Bill Hyde is, I think, among one of the great students of, of Joe, one of the great Joe's, of Joe's mentors, mentees. But I think there are many others, right? And I'm going to. I'm learning this, I'm not. you apologize. I apologize for, for missing them. So uh, that was the reason why I was excited <laughs> to give this to up. And actually, actually then had a second problem. First problem was to find out that Joe was a six foot two center at Cornell, but the, I had a second, a, a second problem, <laughs> I have a third problem with the computer. Oh, there it was, I had a, a, second, a second problem uh, what am I going to talk about, right? What, what am I going to say to this crowd? Um, and I got, I sort of got lucky, um, and, and, but it is a very strange thing, right? It's a strange seminar because I have to say, I think there's only one, maybe, maybe two, maybe two experiments in the whole seminar that happened in my life, right? And, but in tribute to Joe, this is a, a history. This will be the history of the multiple myeloma field, actually, right? And, and some absolutely terrific paper. And the history of this started when uh, I began to read and, in, in literature about something that seemed almost impossible to figure out. And that is the differences, what, what mediated the differences in cancers between individuals of African ancestry and individuals of Caucasian ancestry. The phenotypes are among the most complicated phenotypes you could think of. Really, some of them unbelievable. And as I began to read, and I read because I was, I'm part of a group called Stand Up to Cancer, a foundation which gives money away, and, and we determined that this was an important problem. We, the 30 different people sitting in a room like this and having a conversation about what we should be putting money into next, determined that this was a really important issue, right? Because drugs, I mean, drugs are tested, but they're tested asymmetrically. That we, we know so little about the causes of these differences in uh, cancers uh, between the causes. Not, we know we can make the observations, but not the causes. And so I said, okay, uh, first of all, I didn't have a lab. Secondly, uh, the, the literature turned out, and, and, there, and, and it's almost every case. Well, it's certainly every endodermal cancer and mesenchymal cancers, like like this one. But but that I'll talk about. But but most of the endodermal cancers: prostate, ovarian, colon, um, stomach, esophageal, lung, all extremely different, right? But I chose multiple myeloma, and, 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 and totally we gave away lots of money. And I, I have to say, I'm going to say, that's my opinion, that we didn't get back to enough information from the research. Right? 
Is the time ready? It's always the question. Is the time ready to challenge, get a problem, and to look at it? So I said, damn it, let's, I'm going to go and read the literature. And as I read the literature, I realized that multiple myeloma had been studied tremendously, and that there were people who were studying it who had made observations that made sense to me, and especially John Carlton, right? and, and um, who's now actually, by the way, I think, I don't know if anybody really, why you would normally know this, but he just accepted the job of being the head of the Cancer Center at City Hall. John Kaufman, right? It's really nice. Really deserves it. And 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 so uh, I decided to focus on multiple myeloma. Now, multiple myeloma is one of three cancers which is uh, antithetical, totally antithetical to what I studied on my own, my whole life, P53, right? Why? Because everybody, I think, in a cancer center knows that one of the triggers for activating P53, the transcription factor, which then kills the cells, is DNA damage, right? And so multiple myeloma, which is a plasma cell tumor, B-cell tumor, right? Uh, all the leukemias, T-cell leukemias, right? And uh, all of the testicular teratic carcinomas and the ovarian teratic carcinomas have recombination as part of the normal differentiation pathways, and recombination makes double strand breaks. So they should be dead. Or so we should not have an immune system and we should no longer reproduce, right? If, if dogma were correct about P53. So that it sort of attracted me to think about this as a problem uh, already, and that those cancers were somehow enigmatic. I mean, uh, you'd say actually really nice. Uh, one of the experiments we did do in my lab is a great history, this experiment, and, and it's a good, always good to introduce the last slide first, right? I decided to be why because then people believe if they're really excited about the cancer. <laughs> so here, here we have a, here we have a situation where in uh, testicular teratic carcinomas is a stem cell, right? And, and that stem cell, right, can build a whole body, right, of a mouse in this case, not not, not a human, right? And so uh, uh, we have a, a situation where we have p53 in a stem cell, right? And what's its activity? We were looking at its activity, and we found that it was shrug off. It's transcriptionally dead, right? The protein's there. It's made in large amounts because it doesn't make its negative regulator, MDM2, but it's, but, but it's off, right? And who did that work? A guy named Stuart Lutzka. And who was Stuart Lutzka? Was, he was a postdoc in my lab because of Bill Height. Because Bill Height and I made the following deal when Bill Height showed up at this cancer center. I showed up as a single person, and he's still, he's very good leader. He's wise enough to know he needs bait, right? He needs to get really good people, and there's some really good people at Yale who are looking for jobs. Why would they come here as a single person and he's the best cancer patients, right? So he says, he says to me, he comes over to the prison, and he says to me, I was in prison a few years ago. He said, he said to me, hey, hey. He says, hey, you take these guys for a year or two as a postdoc, and that would be the day. And then they'll come over and they'll open up the clinical area and have a bunch of things. So Lutzer was the first person to do that. And then in my life, he did the last experiment I've ever done. Right? It's really easy. Stuart Lutzer today is second in command of clinicals at Geneva. So, Bill Heights, lineage. Share in that lineage a little bit because of Bill. All right, so um, that's a little bit of the history behind this. Uh, and you'll see as we go on that this really just, the problem really sucked me in. And this is a COVID experience because you can sit and read and you don't need a lab, right? And, the, and this literature is terrific. So let me just tell you who the players are. Uh, I'm here and I'm the speaker, right? And John Coffin is works on multiple myeloma. But he's my, he's my mentor, John Coffin, uh, trained in multiple myeloma, and he did the really key experiment that, that dragged me into this. Maureen Murphy was a postdoc in my lab, and she studies polymorphisms in people of African descent in the P53 gene. Because there turns out to be a fair amount of polymorphisms, in fact, lots of polymorphisms in Africa that differ from Europe. 
right? I unfortunately know very little about Asia, but Africa is a different Europe, right? But in the P53 gene. And I, I can actually, if we went, we talked about this afterwards, I can even say why I think there are a lot of polymorphism, but there are a lot, right? And Morgan Murphy studies that. She opened up the whole field. She's a that was and Piano is the epidemiologist in the P53 field. Uh, almost everything we know about the natural history of diseases in the P53 areas through the, yeah. So I just gathered together the people I thought I needed for support, right? And we're all here on named on the field. So let me introduce you to the play. At end, we've chosen, I'm going to talk about multiple myeloma, but as I as I expand, I have to expand phenotypes. And of course, both, not everything is done with multiple myeloma. Everything I'm going to say is perfectly general to all differences I have ever found between African descent and European descent. In other words, this is, this is I don't like the word determining. I changed it actually, but it didn't change it on the slide. This is, these are some of the polymorphisms and some of the mutations that play a big role in the difference between African descent and, and uh, European descent. <laughs> I spoke so long that I can't now move my slides. But <laughs> so where do I I can come through this? No, that doesn't work. Move slides. <laughs> Next slide, right? That seems like that would be good if everything explodes. You're, I'll do it without slides. Okay. So I, that's my disclosures. Nothing interferes with this. In fact, this is a topic that nobody really has studied in any great detail. Yes, right? Oh, great, it works. So let me just say a few words about multiple myeloma. I didn't know anything yeah. about multiple myeloma, so you'll forgive me for just starting at the beginning. This is the only baby slide, and then we'll go right into facts. All right. All right, so multiple myeloma is a plasma cell tumor, B cell, a differentiated B cell tumor, mostly in, in, in the bone marrow, a little bit. What's the blood too? There are about 35,000 cases a year and 12,000 deaths per year. There are at least two benign precursors of multiple myeloma. I can tell you from the literature there are four or five precursors, benign precursors, but there are two that have been characterized. I'm going to have one that has been very well characterized called MGUS. Uh, MGUS stands for monoclonal gamma apathy of undeterred significance. But that's a poor name because I think we're going to see 12 to 17 percent of the MGUS has become multiple myeloma. So it's the path, starts with benign, goes to right? So MGUS, it's folding up on mine. MGUS is found in about 1.7% of, uh, let me say, African populations very rarely get up to statistical significance. So I'm gonna stay with uh, Caucasian populations right now. And we're measuring African populations as we collect uh, African descent, people of African descent with me. So about 1.7% of Caucasian population by age 50, 5% by age 70. We now know it's about 8% at age 80. So it's it's actually like clonal hematopoiesis in the myeloid system. It's like a clonal hematopoiesis, but it's monoclonalopathies. It's monoclonalopathies. It's an IGH translocation to an, an oncogene, right? So it's, it's like Nick. It's you know, IGH translocation to uh, an oncology, right? And about 20% 20, 20 of MGUS converts in Caucasians uh, to multiple myeloma. Now, for some interesting facts from literature African American descent develops multiple myelomas three to 10 years earlier than Americans of European descent. Um, that's a phenotype. A earlier age of onset. Think about what phenotypes could genotypes could cause early. That's my goal. My goal was what's the genotype of each of these phenotypes, right? The incidence of multiple myeloma in Af Americans of African descent, who have, of course, Americans of African descent that are in the South, especially coming from the slave trade originally, have very mixed genotypes, right? But in, 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 spite of, in spite of that fact, there's two times more per 100,000 
two times more, 500,000 incidents of multiple myeloma in African descent than in Caucasian descent. Incidents, genetically different. That's a pretty good clue, right? First degree relatives of this is the proof that it's really genetically different. First degree relatives of patients with multiple myeloma have a 2.6 fold higher incidence of MDUS at younger ages than someone with no history of multiple myeloma in the family, right? So MGUS, two-fold, two-and-a-half-fold increases in MGUS is an inherited predisposition. So that's, that comes from the literature. You can see already, I'm to get a little excited about this. Oh, life that I always do this. Next, no? No. I think maybe we will uh, okay, all right, yeah. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to summarize this fast now. We're going to start moving fast. Annual rate of multiple myeloma incidence is twice as high, we said, in African Americans than in European uh, Americans. Developed MGUS in multiple myeloma three to 10 years early for African Americans. The age, now this is a very important thing to worry about, the age adjusted prevalence of MGUS, right? age-adjusted prevalence of MGUS three times greater, not really two, right? So if you adjust for age, it goes up because it's earlier, right? So that's MGUS formation. MGUS is benign. It's a translocation, IGH translocation, it's benign. Estimated cumulative risk of MGUS, 17% for, uh, for MGUS to multiple myeloma. So that's the second step, right? That's the spontaneous step, not the inherited step we'll see in a minute, right? Estimated cumulative risk is 17% for African Americans, 15% for European Americans. That's the same number. So the right hypothesis is as follows. A nor at the bottom, the normal cell goes to MGUS, and that's an inherited predisposition. And the inherited predisposition gives rise to spontaneous for the spontaneous mutations over a lifetime, right? They're equal in African Americans and Caucasians, right? And that's the spontaneous case, right? So that's a good hypothesis. There's two different things happening here in this particular disorder. This is just like all oh, of poesis. It's not a surprise, right? Okay. Now for the surprise. So Coughton did this experiment. When he explained it to me, I knew that I was I was real in like a pig. And that was really, it was really not. So let me tell you the experiment Coughton did. Uh, Coffin had 150 individuals of African descent who had multiple myeloma. And he had about, this is disparity, again, he, he had about 500 people of European descent. And he did exon sequencing. So he did a whole bunch of exon sequencing. And he, he found different mutations. There are lots. It's RAS, you'll see there. You'll see almost what you expect in a B-cell lineage. You get lots of different mutations. Then he comes to the P53 mutation, and this is a plot of the P53 mutation. So let me take you through what you're plotting, because this is a plot that I don't think we ever have, it here in the paper, but you, we have ever seen before and gave the first really important clue. So what's plotted on the, on the, uh, on the uh, abscissa here, on the uh, coordinate here, is European ancestry. Now, how do you detect European ancestry? Well, there are polymorphisms between African ancestry and European ancestry. And he did exon sequencing. So he just took all the known differences in those polymorphisms between African descent and European descent, right? And he made a score, right? So everybody has a score, and it's between, obviously, 0 and 100. And, the, and there are a lot of mixtures, of course, right? Expected. And then he said, who's wild type P53? And that's on the left-hand side, and that's in your right-hand side, and so that's in your left-hand side on your uh, wild type, under wild type, or who's mute, right? So uh, there, there are a lot of African descent, people of African descent who have wild type. There are a fair number of people with African descent, uh, of European descent that are wild type. 
And there are a lot of people who are of Caucasian descent or of European descent, and they have mutants. And there's only two people of, 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 European, of African descent which have P53 mutations. The, you're going to see this again and again. The mutations are asymmetric between the two groups of people, depending upon their descent. Now, when I saw that, I said, I threw up my hands and said, tell me a phenotype that discriminates between the two groups, right? Tell me a phenotype, I can't think of a phenotype, right? That is a challenge all the way through, but that phenotype should hold a lot of information. And you're gonna see that phenotype move around in most interesting ways. All right, now the next, right, so this is a serious difference between the two, and the question is, it would mean a lot less if the P53 mutations didn't mean anything to the disease, right? So you have to look at overall survival in days versus percent, percent survival. And what you see, look, just look at the red line, biallelic TP53 mutations. All right, that's the Caucasians that have mutations in P53, both alleles, right? That's 30% less survival, 20% less survival. Then a monoallelic TP53 event, because it's a tumor suppressor, or well, Right? So it doesn't phenotype. Phenotype is survival, right? Overall survival. And overall survival is the phenotype that P53 loves to play with, right? That's a P53 phenotype, and it's in this data, right? Okay, so uh, now we have a situation where if I, we look at spontaneous mutations, and there's a significant difference between African and between descent or ancestry in P53 mutations. That happens to be something that shows up again and again in Holden prostate. The, the differences in prostate show up at the end and again. I'm going to show you data on that toward the end as I generalize this for multiple myeloma. All right. Now, these are the spontaneous mutations that we're talking about. What about, uh, and, uh, and, and now what about this problem, right? I wanna, I have to set this up to give you, start to give you the phenotype, right? What about the problem of the fact that in multiple myeloma, you've undergone BDJ rejoining, you've undergone uh, hypervariable region mutations, that all breaks in the DNA, right? And Africans don't have P53 mutations in P53. And Caucasians do. Right? Is it is that the difference? So here's here's a functional chart of what P53 does to give you a quick clue, right? Stress, DNA damage. There's a sensor, ATM, which is of course on the gene that causes the tumor. Mediators, check two, epigenetic modifiers, all involved in cancer, right? P53 MDM2 complex gets signals from those breaks, right? And it decides to move in one of two directions. Right? One is apoptosis, or one is death. Cells die, and that's P53 the tumor suppressor, really doing its job. Or repair, cell cycle arrest, repair, and order regulation back into cycle. Right? Guy on the right is five different ways to die. Why on earth does P53 have five different ways to die? I can only speculate, but I like the speculation, so I'm going to tell you what I think it is. I think each one of them goes differently to the immune system and regulates the immune system. I think the immune system is playing a big, big role here. And how you die is important to the immune system because it's processing energy. Right? There's even some data I've got a lot of to talk about, unfortunately, which really demonstrates that that's true. Repair is nice, but it isn't as efficient as death, right? So there's an efficiency issue here that is a kind of interesting thing in P53. I'm going to come back to this choice. I mean, how does a signal transduction pathway make a choice, right? Interesting question. All right, now I've talked about the spontaneous mutant. That's P53. Now I want to talk about the inherited mutation. And I think it's the inherited mutations that regulate the differences in 
ancestry between African and European regulated right, in the P53 gene. So we started looking for polymorphisms in the P53 gene. These are monotype sequences, right? But different in Europe and different in Africa. Right? And it turns out there are three of them that really make some sense. Really start to translate the, the mechanism of phenotypes, right? So let me give them to you. So I'll look at the top line first. That's the TP53 protein. Uh, blue is the transactivation domain. Green is something called the proline rich domain. I'll come back to that because there are all the polymorphisms here in there. Uh, yellow is the DNA binding domain. That's where all the spontaneous mutants are, right? So I want to I want to stress something. I'm going to conclude that those polymorphisms in the proline domain are regulated so frequently you get a p53 mutation in the DNA binding domain, how can a protein regulate its own mutation rate, right? That's, that's a new principle. How does a protein regulate its own mutation rate in a different part of the protein? Right? I think we have an answer. Tetramerization domain and a regulatory domain. Three polymorphisms I'm going to talk about. Two are intronic, or pin one and pin two. They're in introns either side of the, of the uh, green domain, the proline domain. And then there's a proline to arginine polymorphism where people in Scandinavia are almost all homozygous arginines and people at the equator, right, all around the world at the equator, at the equator are almost all, uh, are almost all prolines. Proline arginine change is kind of interesting change. Right? Those three polymorphisms have phenotypes that's what's great about P53. There's like a thousand papers on it. So someone's worked on almost everything, right? So let's look at the polymorphisms to be better here. So here's the phenotypes of the polymorphisms. Pin one, pin one is the polymorphism in the proximal intronic domain, as intron two turns out, right? It's a genus C polymorphism, and it regulates the rate, the, the rate at which RNA synthesis occurs, right? So this is the rate of P53 to RNA synthesis would be different in the equator in Africa and in Scandinavia, right? if for that one. N2, which, is a, which has actually a, a stronger phenotype, is a 16 base pair duplication. It regulates both RNA levels and splicing. So the intronic polymorphisms count. They regulate splicing across. They regulate the rate of RNA synthesis. Right? We always thought that P53 is regulated post-translationally. Here it's regulated by RNA. And then there is the amino acid proline to arginine at codon 72. That's exonic. Right? That's exonic. And what does it what does it turn out to be? One of the two MDM2 binding sites to P53. It's the ubiquitin ligase binding site. And furthermore, the, the binding paths that's been measured. Proline is tenfold lower than arginine. Lower proline means more P53. And high proline means more P53, poorer degradation of the protein, right? So when you're finished with these three, you are talking about the level of P53 protein and the two in the cell. In all cells, right? As level could mean something quite interesting. So here's what I told you before about making decisions, right? Here's the P53 protein at the top. Look at R72P, right? Either side in the introns is, in fact, the rate of RNA synthesis. R72P is the rate of RNA, right? Rate of protein degradation. So if you're R, P53, R72, you are undergoing apoptosis. And if you're P, you are undergoing DNA repair and cell survival. Right? Functionally, they're the same, but the efficiency is not. Fold more Africans than the African descent than European descent get multiple myeloma. So is it repair versus that's one hypothesis? It's a hypothesis. We didn't, you know, nobody's measured in multiple in B cell lineages the rate of repair, the rate of right. No one's measured all this yet. Right? But the, what's great about the hypothesis is it's testable. Right. So that's one hypothesis. 
that actually makes sense in every one of the phenotypes I've told you about. All right, so here is phenotypes. Increased number of spontaneous TP53 mutants at another allele exciting in TP53 protein, earlier age of onset of benign cancers, poor overall survival, and the three SNPs, right? That, that's inherited. That's, this is what we're talking about all the inherited SNPs now. They're polymorphisms. So the inherited part is polymorphisms. The spontaneous part is, of course, spontaneous mutants of P53 in a different place. And what's different is the concentration of the two fifty three proteins. Right? Now, the thing that really gives me some confidence that this is important is the last step. These three SNPs are in linkage to single donor. They travel together. Mendel is thrown out the door. Right? These three SNPs travel together. They are traveling together for a reason. You break them up, and the fetus doesn't develop. Protein protein interactions. What? They're very likely. And then I'm going to talk about protein protein interactions. All right. All right so, uh, what evidence is there that I, what I told you, I, I, I've made a hypothesis, that's all. But what evidence is there that this is actually correct? Right? So, I'm going to switch because this is never, the hypothesis never got tested in multiple myeloma. Oddly enough, the hypothesis got tested in non-small cell lung cancer for another reason, right? So let's start with D, non-small cell lung cancer, proline, proline. That's the, that, that's the African descent. Proline, proline, TP53 allele has higher levels of P53 protein in the tumor cells, right? Higher levels, higher RNA, and less efficient degradation of P53, has higher levels. This exerts selection pressure on TP53 for TP53 mutations. But high levels actually are the things selecting for the mutations. So level can select for mutations when level is regulating in a severe way the cell. And then, then the phenotypes versus genotypes. So they took this group of, this was actually a group of mixed individuals who were non-small cell lung cancers from Africa. They weren't from Africa, from Americans of African descent and Americans of European descent. And they looked at the, the, the genotype. If you were proline, proline, homozygote did 65% spontaneous P53 mutations. If you were heterozygote 57, if you're homozygote RR, that's high binding constant for MDM for MDM2. 40%. Well, that isn't that isn't the zero that we saw in multiple myeloma, but it's in the same direction. It is, in fact, a really kind of interesting result because it's it's telling you that there's a bias here that has to do with the levels of the curve. So here's the here's a, map, a little genetic map for everybody. Okay. P53 actually starts in the second intron. The translation is an ATG that translates to 293 amino acids, right? This GC that is the intronic, it's the third intron. Uh, uh, the GC has a splicing mutation, the GC and the A2, that deletes the first 40 amino acids. That means it really changes the first and the first of two transactivation signals, right? And then there's the stick that I told you about. And these guys, these guys, I'm going to show you in a minute now, right? All travel together. So CA2P travels together, GA1R travels together, even though many Africans have come to Europe, have come to the United States, and so forth. They just keep traveling together. Now, again, this has never been done in Europe and, and in the United States and African descent populations. This has been done in Brazil. Why is it done in Brazil? Because there's a, there's a real epidemic of cancer south of Sao Paulo, and it all has the same P53 mutant allele. Why is that? That's inherited, right? That's inherited allele. Inherited allele is what I'm saying is the allele, right? So 
th this is because the Portuguese came to Brazil from Europe and they carried the P53 mutation. Right? <laughs> and the P53, one P53 mutation is called, it's called R337H, uh, R337H histidine. And, and that mutation is now in one in every 300 people south of Brazil. So there's an epidemic of cancers there, right? That are really that are really founder effects, right? 300 years ago, right? So I'm going to show you the data from Brazil. This is it's called Lee Fraumini syndrome. The data from Brazil. If you here are all the possible genotypes on the left hand side. Here are the people's distribution after 300 years of mating, and the mating is really a very interesting mating in Brazil. There were there were individuals of Asian descent who came with the natives of Brazil, came with the Native Americans that came into the into North America and South America, right? So there's plenty of genes that come from Asia, right? Then of course there are people who colonized it and they tended to come from Portugal and they're European, right? And then of course they brought slaves over and they tended to come from West Africa. West Africa, by the way, the polymorphisms here are, are it's really a complicated story because in Africa, the poly, since Africa is the oldest human populations, it has the largest number of polymorphisms. So in West Africa, it's mostly Bantu. And so all the polymorphisms come from a single language group called Bantu, and, and that's the ones we know about. They're just busy sequencing individuals from South Africa now because in South Africa, there's Zulu right, and Sam. Sam, the oldest, probably the only one. They believe to be the oldest humans. Right? And so I don't know. Uh, I'm not mixing apples and oranges when I do this genetically, but that we've been already seen that the early onset, right, phenotype is 70% of the population, right? And the late onset phenotype changes uh, A2 especially. And it turns out you get the best statistics. I mean, this is sort of working backwards, so it's cheating, but you get the best statistics if you add the three, right? No one of them is as good as adding the three. And those are held in linkage disequilibrium, right? So that's pretty, pretty deep. Right? So a lot of things are coming together, right? Which suggests that the, the inherited part of multiple myeloma, right? comes from polymorphisms in the proline domain and the introns and exons. Right? And the spontaneous ones come from regulation of the level of P53, which they're, they're doing. Now, there are lots of examples of differences in cancers. Right? And that's where I have to admit, we have the foggiest idea how to explain the next couple of slides. And this is a slide I promised you by Stuart Lutzka, right? Because this is testicular character carcinomas. So let's take a look. At, that's what we worked on first and missed this whole story. Oops. Only took a lifetime to get it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. This is the proline domain. I want to show you. It's a very pretty domain in P53. So this on the left hand side is the 72 arginine proline polymorphism I've been talking about. And there's barely next to it. And both of them we know is important because look at where the hotspot mutations are 72 and 73. You're at the very, you could change, you could actually change the level of P53, right, by having a mutation in the binding site, right, of the MDM2, of course. Right, but then look at the rest of proline alanine alanine proline, proline alanine alanine proline, proline serine trip proline, right, proline, right. These are signals for SH3 binding sites. Right? They're protein protein interaction sites. So that, that's why you could have linkage disequilibrium, because you've got a lot of polymorphisms that only work in units genetically with protein protein interaction. Now, Stuart Lutzka. This, this is an unfair slide because it's going to confuse you. But you shouldn't feel bad. I don't know anyone who's not confused. Right. So another example of a of a tumor that undergoes will undergo recombination during its normal developmental state 
is testicular teratocarcinomas. These are tumors, it's the single most common tumor for young men, ages 20 to about 40 or so, but 20 to 35. So it has, a, a, of course, it comes in two flavors, that doesn't change, arginine, arginine, and proline, proline, right? Except the number of cases per 100,000 are 33 fold higher in European descent than in, than in African descent. Just the opposite with the same phenotype, genotype, just the opposite phenotype. Now that should be, that, normally that could put you in the force, right? I find that challenging rather than being in a force. But it is a, it is a problem. It is, a, it is a problem, right? That, that genotypes are the same and the phenotypes can switch completely, 100%. The right and left hands, right? But that's a challenge in my opinion. I don't know why this is true. Other than to, I, I can give you a reason, but it's not a reason, it's just a statement. Different tissues are different. Different tissues have epigenetic marks, which are different. I'm gonna bet that the epigenetic marks modify, we know it does, modify the situation. And what Stuart Luskin did for his two years in my lab before he came here, was he showed that in TP53 and stem cells, P53 was turned off. They were Caucasian stem cells because that's all we could get at the time, the 33-fold more, more common. Right? So this turning off of P53 during the recombination steps is, makes some sense. Right? But I don't know. We, we're, we don't know what happens in stem cells from the rare <laughs> So uh, there's lots more to do, but uh, what I like about this is it makes a hypothesis that's testable. And, and I think what the, what the should, should funding agencies usually get it wrong, but funding agencies have sort of come together and said, hey, let's test the odds of this, right? Let's see what, what, what we get, because there are not many hypotheses that explain the differences in the cancers, right? So I'm going to finish up and tell you why I think this is really important. Right? In multiple myeloma, there's some really interesting and good drugs that are coming along. And people who used to live one and two years with multiple myeloma are now living 10 or even longer years with multiple myeloma. Why? Because of these drugs. And they, and they work in series. So you just keep giving one right after the other, right? And, and then you run out of the drugs and then unfortunately people will. So I'm going to give you the numbers, right? There was there was a meta <laughs> there was a meta analysis of the you know everything that publishes their clinical trials in, in, in .gov, right? And and there, there were a series. So you go to .gov and you look at all the patients and you look who are declared to be of African descent, who are declared to be of European descent, so forth. So here the here are the numbers, right? With every one of these drugs, that's like eight drugs, right? With every one of these drugs, we, I'm going to just add up the numbers. 91% of the people were from European descent. 6% of the people were from Asian descent. 4% of the people were from African descent. We have no idea these drugs, how these drugs work on people of African descent. And the problem, there's a real problem here that I think Everybody should realize, because it is a real problem, right? If you're a company making eight or nine billion dollars a year from the drugs, you're not going to invest, you're not going to reopen clinical trials to find out who they work on and who they don't work on. They have no incentives to do this. So a number of us have written to the FDA and we said, look, um, there's a real incentive to do these kinds of studies so we can understand whether the drugs are working, who the drugs are working on, who they're not. So I, I would say there's a lot of reasons to want to know the answers to these questions, but I think it's going to help us all understand cancer in a much more subtle and a, and a better way. So let me, I'm probably, oh, and I did it all within five minutes to spare. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there are any questions. I know I can feel 
I think I confuse audiences with this because it's not simple, but that's fun. Simple question. How robust are the frequency estimates for these work canceling target parts? Do you have enough cases to actually say that there's the incidents the differences are robust? No. Okay. We really don't. Um, so, so maybe uh, that that's just the reason the data. I mean, uh, oh no, no. Well, we have enough cases to know the frequencies. That's yeah. not a problem. Because you can go to hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, actually, it, uh, I can tell you the thing where both little myeloma comes from was the Ghana. That, but but Ghana, Ghana turns out to have a very good health care system, and South Africa has a very good health care system that can get you information about frequencies. That's not that's not frequency. The, the problem with the, it's the it's the Lutzker experiment, right? Yeah, I've got yeah. four cell lines, right? For, and they're all Caucasian, right? I have four cell lines. That's that's what those data come from. I mean, I, you can't say every testicular tear the cosmic, right? No, and that is a problem. Right? But you know, the, the whole tumor is really so enigmatically interesting. I, for instance, you differentiate those cells, and they're benign, right? People actually get cures from the differentiation process. So it's pretty clear, and p53 turns on, right? So it's pretty clear that. Um, and that's true for many people who are patients, not cell lines. But, but yeah, these are they're, they're pulling things out of literature and you never know. You know, I'm, ha I'm happy when I see something and you never know how many papers or what I know. I don't think. So, Arnie, so for the uh, multiple myeloma, so based on current uh, information, you would predict the African American. With P53, uh, proline, proline would respond to the drug better. Is that, is that uh, the and, and yes, so I, you're a good boy. You're right on top of it. So uh, you're a public college. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I thought the same thing you did. So I, I go to my mentor, right? I go to Compton. And, and Compton was, he's looking at exactly this. Compton is African American. so. He's looking at exactly this, and he says, you know, my feet are incomplete, but this particular drug works much better on African-Americans than it does on Caucasians, right? And that's just, of course, luck of the draw, but that tells you there's differences, right? That tells you there's differences that you want to exploit. And God damn, the pharmaceutical companies are happy with what they've got, right? I said that to Bristol Myers Squibb. They never called me back. <laughs> I felt like I was jilted. <laughs> but um, the, the, you, this is really neat because you can probe into questions exactly like that, right? And they mean something to people, they, and they make a difference. So I, I, I just think that uh, this, this <laughs> knowledge in this area of differences in cancers between individuals which are going to teach us a lot about what's important and what's happening and what's why are things different and things like that and it's pretty rare that anybody seems to be you know i went i went to my first meeting on uh these meetings are called disparities. They're always called, they always talk about the word disparities. These meetings are called disparities, right? And they divided in half the meetings. Half the people talk about social science disparities, and they are real. They are, I mean, you sit there horrified with the disparities of the reality of the American healthcare system and the so forth. Um, and then there's genetics. That's the other half, right? And, and uh, it just always seemed to me that if we could figure out the genetics, that we could figure out the right drugs to give the right people. I actually have a question. I'm, I'm not a cancer biologist. I know very little about P53. So the, the P53, the poly yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, polymorphism, like that's inherited, like, and there's certain like, somatic mutation also cause P53 mutations that's in right. cancer. So how does that impact, we said like, again? You know, uh, actually, um, if you, uh, there's two kinds of polymorphisms now for that are inherited in P53. The ones I talked to you in the proline domain actually at, at first have no phenotype. 
right? Because you're not born with cancer or anything like that. Right. And, you know, develop, these people develop cancer of a lifetime, right? And they, they get these monoclonalopathies, which we all get, everybody gets. They're just mutations in your B cell lines, or in this case, or your myeloid lines, and it's clonal hematopoiesis, or, right? So uh, they, they don't look too bad, they're, they're benign, right? Uh, but they develop into cancers as you get older. So these multiple myelomas are cancer who's on average age about 65, 60, but for Africans on average age about 55 or 50, right? That's the earlier age of onset kind of, of, of setting. So what's the phenotype of that? Well, it's in the inherited business. But the truth of the matter is, what scares, I think, the pharmaceutical, I hate to trick pick on the pharmaceutical companies, they make good drugs. But, but the, the truth of the matter is, but this whole lecture just says, it just says, if you're going to work on a drug for multiple myeloma, stop the benign tumor because it's the precursor of the malignant tumor, right? Stop the adenoma, that's it's, it's colonoscopy. Cut the adenoma out and it won't develop into a carcinoma, right? So you can't cut out the B cell tumor, but you could find a drug that actually, that, that, Detect, we don't even have an assay to detect monoclonalopathies because they're really hard to find in any one of them. And they, you know, you have 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th, different kinds of B cells. Which ones are monoclonalopathies? So we don't have good assays for that. And then the second problem, so we, we look, that's exactly what we're doing now, is looking for really good assays for that and collect. Uh, very large group of African Americans didn't really find out what the statistics are. Mm -hmm. We don't know, I don't know if anybody works on viruses here, but we don't know if Epstein Barr virus, which is a B cell virus that causes Burkett lymphoma, right? It's a B cell tumor, right? We don't know. And you get it as children if you live in the poor neighborhood, and you get it as much later age, teenage years, if you live in a rich neighborhood. But I, in fact, I. I'll finish up with a biogra biographical story, not about Joe, about me, right? I was a first year graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. The year is 1961, before some of you were born. And, and, <laughs> and there's a, a husband-wife team from Germany that are working at Children's Hospital, right? And what are they working on? They're working on Burkitt lymphoma. So this guy Burkitt had described the lymphoma in Africa, and when they looked at it, they saw virus particles in it. And Henley was a virus hunter, and Henley was hunting virus, right? And I rotated in his lab. It was my first rotation. And the reason was I was thrilled about the idea. It was the first cancer virus in humans, right? In human virus that could cause cancer. I was thrilled about that, right? So I go into the lab. You, they take your blood right away. And I'm positive for that. I hadn't been in the lab for <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be positive for the virus. I was, I was sort of born up in a lower socioeconomic neighborhood, but not that bad. <laughs> so I, I, it was weird. Well, at least I had gone through college, so maybe that was the problem. But, so the ultimate test they did, well, so the first idea they got that it was causing infectious mononucleosis, which is the proliferation of B cells that T cells turn around and kill and you recover, right? So the first indication they had was they took blood from everybody in the first year at Yale. And in the fourth year, they met them again, and they all had seroconverted, right? Why? Because no one poor goes to Yale, right? They're all a socioeconomic group. It's all negative at the first year of college. And they're sick. After all, it's infectious matter is a kissing disease. So that was the fourth year, most people get seroconverted. You know who seroconverted first was Henley's technician. And it scared the hell out of us when she came down with infectious mono. So B cells are proliferating and we're all in this lab, right? Now, we, that, that's Burkitt lymphoma, right? That's the EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, right? We don't know anything about the effect of Epstein-Barr virus upon lower socioeconomic groups getting it at earlier ages. I mean, there's so many things that people aren't, putting in the equation yet. So the good news is that th th there's enough of these things so you can write a, still write a good grant. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, let me say thank you for inviting me for Joe's memorial. <laughs>